The leader who has claimed to be divinely chosen by God has lived and enacted laws that are contrary to the word of God. His supporters are pulling out scriptures to support his authority, but they don't really fit the overall belief system and any opposition that points out these fallacies are silenced, ignored, or under the threat of death. Today we'll be looking at John Locke's first treatise of government and how it challenged this idea of the divine right of kings. I'm Christian Murray and this is The Founders Club. Before we can grasp Locke's first treatise of government, we have to understand Locke as an individual and the society that he was responding to. Growing up in England made Locke weary of an absolute monarchy. He lived through the English Civil War, saw the absorption of Ireland into the United Kingdom, and witnessed the authority of tyrannical rulers. These events caused a lot of divisions within the United Kingdom, and the political world was constantly shifting with alliances ever changing. Luckily, Locke was young enough that he didn't have to really choose a position during the worst years, but his father had to choose and fight. As an officer in the parliamentary army, he saw the worst and eventually lost everything. Locke was left with very little, but he studied and observed. This was surprisingly advantageous for Locke. He would go to Oxford and become a scholar and would eventually study medicine. He was a close friend of Robert Boyle and they studied chemistry together. His medical studies pushed him to become one of Britain's first empiricists. Empiricism means he believed that our experiences are the most reliable source of knowledge rather than innate ideas and reason being our primary source. This gave rise to experimental science and emphasized the role of empirical evidence in the formation of ideas. Locke states, Speculations, however curious and refined or seeming profound and solid, if they teach not their followers to do something either better or in a short and easier way than otherwise they could, or else lead them to the discovery of some new and useful invention, deserve not the name of knowledge, or so much as the waste of time of our idle hours to be thrown away upon such empty, idle philosophy. While he was studying medicine, he met Anthony Ashley Cooper, who asked Locke to be his personal advisor, often including medical advice, after being impressed with the man. When Lord Ashley became the first Earl of Shaftesbury in 1673, Locke's role grew, and he became more involved in politics. He would find himself at one extreme end of the political debates of his generation, competing with very influential thinkers who supported strong authoritative rule, such as Thomas Hobbes. This brings us to the divine right of kings. Once Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church over a century before Locke in 1533, questions concerning religious and political authority exploded. As people questioned the legitimacy of their rulers, many thinkers came up with different ways to legitimize or delegitimize the position of their leaders. Some came to their ruler's aid by supporting an extreme position, an absolute monarchy. Supporters tried to legitimize the idea of an absolute monarchy in a multitude of ways. One of these ways was the idea of divine right. The divine right of kings is the theory of government that holds that a monarch receives the right to rule directly from God and not from the people. Locke published his treaties in 1689. They were written in 1680 and 81, but publishing them under his own name was far too risky. He wrote them to respond to James VII of Scotland taking the English throne. Locke's political philosophy rested upon his religious beliefs, which left him in a good position to critique this idea of the divine right. In Locke's first treatise, he dismantles divine right activist Robert Filmer's work, Patriarcha. He chose Robert Filmer because of his reputation, and Filmer carried his argument farthest and is supposed to have brought it to perfection. In his book, Filmer uses the Bible to justify the divine right of kings by inflating paternal power with political power. The main point of his biblical argument is that Adam was made to be the first king and given total dominion of the world by God. He asserts that legitimate kings are a part of the lineage of Adam, therefore they, like their distant father Adam, have absolute dominion. Locke summarizes what Filmer's position actually means by stating, his system lies in a little compass, it is no more but this, that all government is absolute monarchy, and the ground he builds on is this, that no man is born free. As Locke reads Patriarcha, Locke finds and states, 
Scripture or reason, I am sure, do not anywhere say so, notwithstanding the noise of divine right, as if divine authority hath subject us to the unlimited will of another. If Filmer's ideas don't actually come from Scripture, where does Filmer actually conceive of paternal power equating to political power? There is an old pagan Roman law called Patria Potestas, which means power of the father. It is the power that the male head of a family exercised over his children and his more remote descendants of the male line, whatever their age, as well as over those brought into the family by adoption. This power meant originally not only that he had control over the persons of his children, amounting even to a right to inflict capital punishment, but that he alone had any rights in private law. Thus, accusations of a child became the property of the father. As Rome was Christianized, it did away with this pagan law because it went against scripture. Patria Potestas is exactly like Filmer's ideas, except in Filmer's ideas, the state is the family and the king is the father. Locke works through Filmer's work and cuts through it by showing, first, that Adam had not either by natural right of fatherhood or by positive donation from God, any such authority over his children or dominion over the world as it is pretended. Second, that if he had, his heirs yet had no right to it. Third, that if his heirs had, there being no law of nature nor positive law of God that determines which is the right heir in all cases that may arise, the right of succession, and consequently of bearing rule, could not have been certainly determined. Fourth, that if even that had been determined, yet the knowledge of which is the eldest line of Adam's posterity, being so long since utterly lost, that in the races of mankind and families of the world, there remains not to one above another the least pretense to be the eldest house, and to have the right of inheritance. Locke states, all these premises having, as I think, been clearly made out, it is impossible that the rulers now on earth should make any benefit or derive any the least shadow of authority from that which is held to be the fountain of all power, Adam's private dominion and the paternal jurisdiction. Luck literally says that even if Filmer is right, he is still wrong because of how awful and absurd the outcome of his reasoning is. To Locke, Filmer didn't have any kind of common sense with this. He was pulling scriptures out of the biblical context and building an entire theology based on that that enslaved mankind. Locke concludes his treatise by looking at the history told in the Bible and the history of the world since then and states that there is no evidence to support Filmer's arguments. If anything, the Bible goes against the idea of a monarchy. When the people of Israel wanted a king, Samuel gave a list of reasons why they did not want a king, and God responded in 1 Samuel 8, 7 by saying, And heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. In his first treatise, Locke uses scripture and reason to tear Filmer's arguments apart. He dismantled the idea that this kind of government is legitimized by God. So yes, Filmer is wrong way wrong, hopelessly wrong. But people still believed it. People still believed his arguments in the divine right of kings. Why? Well, it bears consideration. With this idea of divine right of kings out of the way, it prompts a new question. What does make any government legitimate? Let us know what you guys think in the comments below. In our next video, we'll be going over Locke's revolutionary answer to that question. Well, I think that's all we have for this video, so if you like this video, hit that like button. If you like the channel and want to become a Founders Club member, hit that subscribe button. And, well, remember, history is a good story that needs to be told. So tell it.